We are an independent, spirit-filled church in North Fort Worth. We are Mercy Life Church. Is it on? Yes. Okay, cool. Am I good? Yep. Okay. Well, I would say good morning, but it is evening. Um, but before I even welcome y'all, I just want to say I picked out these homilies about three to four days ago, past two videos, <laughs> not a homily, video. And this is before, because Pastor Will was going to do a completely different homily, same concept, just totally different. You know, and I think it's actually out of the same book, too. Just totally different. But then he did that after I picked the videos. And so when I was showing them, I was like, hey, would you have a uh, uh, mic hack at? In my pocket. And it's all going to clip it on. Okay. Okay. Do I need to repeat anything? Uh, no. I kind of get it out, but uh, we still have Okay, okay. Um, but, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, videos. So, when I picked that out, I had no idea what he was going to be covering at that point. And then he ended up telling me that he told me a completely different thing, and both of them were going to be great. You know, either way, it was going to be good. And so, as I ran and did my prayer that I do every weekend before I came up here to preach the message, I was like, you know what? Those gotta go along with his message. And it was completely unplanned. You know, that's just how God works. So we are so excited. And what's actually very cool too, Will, is the open doors and all that, demons, the devil speaking. I'm gonna be covering that next week in deeper detail. So that's really cool. So I just think it's amazing how God works. But welcome back to Mercy Life Church. My name is Pastor Tristan. But if you're new here, I'm the senior pastor. And oh boy, are y'all in for a convicting treat? I don't know how else to word it. Can they hear me down here? I don't know how else to word it because these next six weeks are going to be deep. Now, let me explain what's going to happen. We all should know at this one, Easter is coming up in about a month. So I'm going to do a mini series on Easter. And by the way, Pastor Will, this is going to be new to you. I have the name of the series. The series is going to be called The Impossible Possible. And what I'm going to be doing is... I'm going to be doing two messages. The one on, what do you call it the week before you, sir? Palm week? Uh, Palm Sunday. Yeah, Palm Sunday, but we're going to be doing it on Saturday. And that's going to be Grave Shaker. We're going to talk about times in the Bible where people shook the grave. And I'm not even going to tell you what that means. You're going to have to wait and see. But then for Easter, I'm doing a message called The Last Three Days. And it's going to cover Friday to Sunday, the last three days that Jesus was alive as a human. So I'm so excited about that. We're going to cover the crucifixion. We're going to cover the, um, what happened Saturday? Oh, yeah, the burial? No. No? Uh, nothing happened. Okay, nothing happened Saturday. And then, well, okay, we'll get into that later. So I am very excited about that because, one, as a preacher, the crucifixion, I want to preach on that as much as I can. And it's not something many people would like to preach on because it's a very hard topic. You know, so I'm very excited about that. I know God's going to do great things through that. And so please join us for those two weeks, and we will give you more detail as we know what's going on. Because uh, we don't even know where we're going to have Easter at just yet. But so, like I mentioned at the beginning, we are in a series. So we're going to cut the series in half and do an Easter series, and then get back into the series. And then... It, it's going to be, so the series we are starting today is called Another Jesus, and it is the series that I have been wanting to bring to you for so long. Can you go to black screen? And I brought this whole series into one message, which was like an hour, 15 minute message. So these messages, my goal is to make it shorter. This message is going to probably be the longest because I'm laying the foundation for the entire series. So pretty much. The next five weeks, or six weeks, we are going to be diving head deep into what Scripture says and a personal message that God gave me back in 2021. Now, the Bible talks and warns about people serving another Jesus. The Bible warns us over and over. Now, it doesn't say that phrase, another Jesus, but the Bible warns it over and over and over again. And Charles Spurgeon said, a time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, listen to this. The church will have clowns entertaining the goats. Now, I am sorry. I do not want to hear the word clown near anything referring back to the church, but it is so true. 
I saw a thing the other day that you guys are lucky we don't show 20 minutes transitions because I saw a video that really made me angry as one, a believer, and two, as a leader in the church. And I told Pastor Will about this, and I'm not going to name the church because I'm not a name dropper, but Pastor Will should remember the name of the church. And basically, they did it on a Super Bowl Sunday, and they literally had people kicking the Bible. And after I saw that, I was like, so this is what it's come to. We are entertaining clowns instead of entertaining sheep. And really, church isn't about entertaining anyone. So before we go any further, this entire series is in a so far 34 chapter book. And I have wrote the introduction. Like before you went to the first chapter, I wrote the introduction and I want to read it to you. So the following couple of paragraphs are from the book. And this is the only taste or the only thing you're going to get out of the book. So don't be asking me for other stuff. <laughs> So it is as follow. Hello, and welcome to Another Jesus. My name is Tristan Hart, and I am the author of Another Jesus. Another Jesus isn't just another book. Another Jesus is my life message. It is the most important message you can hear from me. It is a message that will change your life. I know this because it has changed my life. This message is a never-ending revelation of truth. It is a journey of faith. It is a message that I truly believe can impact thousands of lives. If God lets it happen, and I believe he can. So join me on this journey. And you realize I said journey because a lot of sermon series is, you know, like I didn't think that was great. Pastor Will did amazing, you know, and I really enjoyed it. But to me, that's more of a teaching moment and not a journey. A journey or most of the series and most of the messages I will bring to you are journeys. And most of them are journeys that I have been on myself. Because I don't believe in preaching anything I've never been through. And trust me, that it's coming in the future. You know, we're coming around to do things like that. It's just taking us more time. So, first thing I wanted to point out is my inspiration for this. 2020 was a chaotic year. Can all agree on that? Uh, Pastor Will, can you hand me my water bottle that's right beside you on the other side? Yeah. 2020 was just a chaotic year. We can all agree on that. So much happened. And the, and the year started off pretty good for most people. You know, I'm speaking for myself. I was still in high school, started it off, you know. And so it's January. Then February comes, and we're learning about this thing called COVID-19 and coronavirus. And people were like, who do you after a beer? That the secular part of me is talking. <laughs> and so people are like, who would, what? what is this coronavirus? What is this? And so I did a little research paper on it in school, and back 2020, February, we knew nothing about this virus. We didn't even know it was an actual thing that would impact that would impact the United States. But at that time, I started noticing that churches were not preaching the Jesus that I knew. And at that time, I didn't know Jesus. I just knew the loving Jesus that loves people. I didn't know anything else because I wasn't that saved, if really saved at all. And, but the more and more I realized it, the more and more I was like, what are y'all doing? And this message, the third message in the series is what this entire thing came out of. It started as a message that I called Exposed Truth. And we're, we're going to get there in two weeks. I'm very excited about that message. That message is going to challenge everyone's theology. And I'm, I'm going to be calling out a lot of people that need to be called out. So make sure you check that out. But what I realized is... That the Jesus that the Bible talks about, the Jesus that we preach here, wasn't the Jesus that people were teaching. People were teaching the Jesus that makes you rich. People were teaching the Jesus that accepts your homosexuality. People were teaching the Jesus that condemns people to hell. And all of that is not the Jesus that I know. The Jesus I know doesn't condemn anyone. How do I know that? John 3, 17 says it exactly. You know, and I don't have the verse in here, but it says it exactly. And so over time, I realized this was my life message. How did I realize that? Because everywhere I went, I was pointing out to people left to right, hey, uh, that's another Jesus. That looks like another Jesus. But I didn't know what I wanted to call the message yet because it was called Exposed Truth. Then one day I was like, well, if you're not preaching Jesus, you're preaching another Jesus. And I go, oh, that's good. I like that. So I just wrote that down. Well, Let's be honest, I don't write. I typed sit down, and then a couple months later, God brought it back to my mind, and I was like, another Jesus? Huh. 
okay. And so I started writing it. But when I started writing it, I just wasn't flowing properly in my mind. And as a pastor, and most pastors, if you sit down to write a sermon and it isn't coming to you like most of your sermons, then maybe it's not the topic God wants you to preach or write about at that time. Because at that time, I knew nothing about the gospel. I knew nothing. Now, I'm not going to say I know the entire Bible, but I know the basics. And I know more than most people my age that didn't grow up in church know. You know, so... <clears throat> Sorry, I know that went right into the mic. But God brought this to my attention last week. This next scripture, I didn't even have in here. But then I realized that I needed it. If I was going to point out another Jesus, I had to let you know what God says in Exodus 20. Now, Exodus 20 are the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai. On Mount Sinai. See, I even have to get my theology correct. <laughs> on Mount Sinai. And it is the what I like to call God's top 10, which I have a series on that. We're probably not going to get around this year because that's like 10 weeks. <laughs> and I don't like... Doing seven or six weeks on another Jesus is really pushing it for me. I don't like him when pastors do that, but here I am doing it. So if you will open your Bibles to Exodus 20, verse 3. And Pastor, well, if you can continue after this. Because like, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, okay, let me stop you right there. No other gods. No, God put us Father, but he said God. Because anything that you worship, and it could simply be this technology, or you can worship the cross and Jesus. It's your choice. So anything can be seen as a God. Picking back up, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven or above, or that is in, hang on, give me one second, yeah, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, verse 5. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Now, now I want you to look at, now let me ask you a question before I show you the next pick. It is a cold winter day. It's snowing outside. And you just wake up and you're freezing cold. You're just freezing cold. What is the number one thing you're going to go to 8, 9, 10 o'clock in the morning when you're freezing cold? A delicious piping hot cup of coffee. Or if you're like me or Pastor Will. And by the way, guys, um, I'm, I love AI. So we're going to be using a lot of AI picks in here. So I'm not going to take the credit for this because I cannot create something that beautiful. And sometimes, if you're like me or Pastor Will, you like cold coffee. That right there makes me want to go down to Starbucks and get me a cold coffee or an iced coffee because they got delicious outlooks. But have you ever had it where you let a coffee sit out all day and it just got really, really, really horrible, warm, and not even warm? What's that word I'm looking for? It's uh, Luke warm. Look at that. Does that look amusing? Does that look like you want to take a drink? And I already can think of someone that would say, oh, I would. <laughs> and Will knows who I'm talking about. Somebody who doesn't really like hot things or anything like that or really much coffee at all but one place. But just like me and you and most people, there's a thing called a lukewarm Christian. So if you will, go to Revelation 5. No, Revelation 3, starting in verse 15. I know your works. You are neither cold. Yeah, yeah, you are neither cold or hot. Would that you were neither cold or hot. It's so, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, this is Jesus speaking. If Jesus said he's going to spit you out of his mouth and other translations say vomit, then there's an issue. Some of you Christians today, if you would look at Jesus, I can guarantee that Jesus would say, I spit you out of my mouth because you are neither cold nor hot. You are lukewarm, meaning you either one, 
go to church and you don't care and you just go home, party on the weekends, things like that, which people go to church every day. And those are the people who look like they're having a good time. Or you have the people who want to make it to church so bad, it kills them. They can't go because either one, they're sick or they don't have a ride or they just don't have time. Those are the Christians that are hot. Me and Pastor Will, we haven't made it to church in almost a month, if not a month by now. And it doesn't matter what church we go to at this point. We just need to go to church. And that's actually our plan tomorrow morning. And because... It's church, but... Yeah, we've been to this church over and over again. <laughs> but it's just, you are missing out. If you are not going to church every week and you are missing out. Because, hang on, let me ask you a question. When If you go to the gym once a month, are you going to get rid of that fat? No. Just like that, you cannot be spiritually strong if you do not get spiritual food into your system. And I believe this is the next verse. Yeah, Romans 1. And Pastor Will did um, a lot of Romans in his last message and the Identity series. And I actually stole a lot of those scriptures from him because it was just so good. Listen to this. This is amazing. This is Paul, correct? This is Paul. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Now, it didn't say to people who believe. It said everyone. Everyone who believes to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Romans, continuing Romans 1, skipping over to verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man, men. Now, right now, I can guarantee it. Half of you probably shut me out because you heard the wrath of God. Uh, keep listening because it's not going to get better. <laughs> who, who by their unrighteousness suppress the good? No, suppress the truth. If you are teaching another Jesus, you are suppressing the truth of the gospel. And let me tell you, that is not something that God likes. That is, oh, you don't even understand. For what can be known about God is plain to them because, listen, atheists and non-believers, listen to this, because God has shown it to them. You cannot tell me God is not real. Because, one, you're telling me that you know everything and that you know every little detail about this earth and know who created the earth, when in reality, you don't know. Because you don't While it just went out. Did it? Oh, oh, yeah, it's back. Is it back? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I'll keep this over here just in case. Your, uh, last what was my last sentence? Crap. Hang on. Give me a sec. I forgot my last sentence. How do I do that? Whatever. Oh, you cannot tell me that God is not real. No matter what you believe, no matter how much traumatic experiences you have had, you cannot tell me that God is not real. Because, one, there is only one correct worldview. And two, if you tell me atheist means, literally means that what you think it would mean. Me, oh, hang on, I knew this. I just heard this. Whatever. Sorry, I, I had all of this down, and then all of a sudden, it all just went blank. Um, But God reveals himself to you. He makes it known to you. Because what kind of father wouldn't want his... Children to know who he is. Okay, picking up in verse 20. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have made that have been made, so they are without excuse. Atheist, socialist, you are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became foot futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. You know, there's actually a verse in Psalms that says only the fool doesn't believe there's a God. I, I forget what Psalms it is, but only a fool doesn't believe there's a God. And exchanged the glory of the immoral 
immortal, immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Now, hang on. Before we go any further, I need you need to know this right now. And if you're taking notes, you need to write this down. If you seek God, he will make himself known to you, no matter what. Back. I'll be right back. I'm going to let the cat out. He's being too loud. See, oh, I think you're in an awful. Yeah, he's right in my ear. Come on. Cheeto. No wonder you're being loud. Stop messing with princess. Where was I? Uh, I think we just talked about creeping madness. Yeah. Yeah. If you are saying that, which honestly, I'm just going to throw it out there. Evolution is a dumb, dumb thing. Because it's crazy that you think that, this, that we come from animals. That is just beyond me. That is seriously beyond me. But we're not going to go there. I have a whole other series that talks about that. Now, continuing Romans 1. By the way, Romans 1 isn't a um, Bible study you want to do with your new believer. I'm just, just going to make it clear. If you have a friend who's a new believer, don't talk to them about Romans 1 just say because they might not be a believer after that. Because, <laughs> funny story, Romans 1 was actually our first study as a church that we started the first week of the church. I think we kept it for like three weeks, and we were like, ooh, is this what kind of church we're going to be? Yeah. <laughs> Ever since then, yeah, that's what kind of church we are. So Romans 1, continuing in verse 24, Therefore God gave them up, meaning the unrighteous, in the lust of their hearts, to impurity. Now, hang on. I need to make something known. This is something that God's been pouring on my heart recently. I'm no saint. I'm just going to out there. I struggle with lust. I struggle with my own sin. Pastor will struggle with his own sin. We all struggle. We are not perfect. God, <laughs> God doesn't call perfect people. God calls imperfect people to do his perfect will. So we are not perfect. So I and I am not judging anyone by preaching this message. I am simply just preaching what God has put on my heart. Impurity to to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the cre the creature rather than the Creator. Sorry, guys. I won't be drinking a lot. I've been also been having some health issues this week with my sinuses. So maybe I can even speak. We're also on some strong antibiotics. Yeah, I'm also on some antibiotics too. So my mouth is all over the place and that sounds horrible. Edit that. <laughs> <laughs> Who is blessed forever. Amen. 26. For this reason, God gave them up in dishonorable passions. God will, God will let you have your own way. God is not this evil God that is going to just condemn you because you don't worship him. No, he's, he's not like that. He will give you up for your own passions. I have a family member right now who grew up Christian and now it's just completely against the faith. And I strongly believe that God still loves them and that God is still going to do a great thing in their life if they just allow him to. For their, for their women exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature and the men Likewise, gave up natural relations with women and consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves for the due penalty for their error. Now, just in case you want understanding Bible knowledge, point blank is just saying that men gave up natural relations with women and started indulging in homosexuality. Now, guys, this is probably the hardest thing for me to preach on because I lived out that exact verse. I have a history of homosexuality and I praise God every single day that he has set me free and it is a battle to this day. I'm going to make a quote that half of you probably won't agree with. Homosexual thoughts are different than homosexual acts. And there's a study showing that out of 50% of men, 50% of them have had homosexual thoughts. It is normal to have thoughts like that, but it's not normal to indulge in thoughts like that. It is not normal to live out those thoughts. Because the enemy is going to do whatever he can to get you away from the will of God. I promise you he will. Romans 1, 28. I told you, we're reading a lot out of Romans. 
And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to debased, debased, yeah. debased minds to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips. Verse 30, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful. Yeah, boastful inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. The Bible is naming everything. <laughs> Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Now, I got to go off in a minute. I got to tell y'all a couple things. This is really what gets me mad about people who are living in life of homosexuality is the fact that they push it in your face and say, oh, it's okay. God loves you. Yes, God loves you. But what did we just read? God will let you do your own thing. He will give you up for your own passion. That doesn't mean that it's right. You know, just because it feels good doesn't mean it's good. You know, we think that God and that good and God are synonymous. And don't worry, you're going to hear all about that in the fifth message. But it's just unbelievable because I have a family member, the same family member I mentioned earlier, who point blank told me, oh, I'm gay, but God loves me. Yeah, he does. He does. But let me ask you a question. Parents or anybody that's worked with, works with youth or ever works with kids, do you like it when kids do something bad? No. But sometimes you got to have a little bit of tough love in them. And tough love is the worst love. But you got to do it. So point, to put it simply, to serve another Jesus means, simply means to serve a Jesus that you created in your own image. Now let me ask you this. Who created man? Genesis 1 says, I think it's Genesis 1. God said, or it says that God created male and female. He created them. God created them. It says God created them like three different times because God created male and female. Many people want Jesus as a savior, but not lordship of Christ. Lordship. What does that mean? Lordship simply means, oh, I believe that's the oh, wrong one, wrong one. Lordship simply means the lordship of Jesus Christ means that we recognize him as who he is and give him the honor that he deserves. Simply put, it means that we honor Jesus. By doing what he says. And if you want an actual definition, the definition would be supreme power or rule over one's life. So let's go to Galatians. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live by flesh I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, I want to tell you a little story. Tracking, please. Like, you know what? There was a point in my life where I was saved, but I was a lukewarm Christian. I was still doing awful things with my body and partying. I did a little bit of drugs at one point in my life, and I am so horribly upset to admit it, but it took a message about the crucifixion to really put in my head what happened. And no, it wasn't the message. It was the passion of the Christ. And I was watching it and I was like, that really happened to Jesus? What? That's horrible. And he died for me so I could wouldn't believe in him? Right there, if you need any proof, the cross right there is all the proof that you need. And if you need any more, any more proof than that, then Satan is talking to you. So next point I want to talk about is crucifying your flesh. Now, a lot of this are broken down into bits and pieces in the book. Um, so all of this is just the first chapter. The flesh must be crucified. That means anything that is flesh, anytime you talk about flesh, is referring back to your sin. We must crucify our flesh. And an amazing quote 
by John Bevere. And if you follow the church law, you know that we love John Bevere. And if you're watching John Hay, <laughs> he said, our flesh wants what the world wants. Our spirit wants what only God can give us. So watching pornography, your soul, not your soul, your flesh wants that. Because that feeling that you get, let's be honest, there's nothing more satisfying than just watching pornography. There's nothing more satisfying. Why? Because you are in control of what you can do, what you watch, what you watch. But just because it feels good doesn't mean it's of God. Really wish I had some people in here to say amen. <laughs> Mark 14, 38. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, just because that says the flesh is weak doesn't mean that it's going to be easy to beat temptation. Beating temptation is the hardest thing you're going to need to deal with as a believer. I don't care what anybody says. You're never going to get free from it because the devil loves tempting people. Now, when I mean by set free, I don't mean that God's not going to set you free. No, God's going to set you free. But just because you got freedom does not mean that you're not going to fall back into sin. And that is out of the Kairos handbook. I didn't know what else to call it. Um, it's a program. It's a freedom ministry that you go through um, at Gateway. And I know other churches do it as well. I just don't know other churches. Um, and I'm actually going to do a series called Kairos, which is going to be basically what Gateway teaches about it. But your flesh is weak, meaning... <laughs> I'm sorry. Your flesh is weak, meaning if you are filled with the Spirit, the devil will flee. So you probably hear him too. No? no? Okay, great. This... Galatians 5 9, 5 19, excuse me. Now, the works of the flesh are evident sexual Im immorality, impure sensuality. Yeah. Sensuality. Oh, okay. Impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, peace, dissensions, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warn, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I will. Can I get you to go fill this up at the sink? Yeah. I'm about to go on a talking fit for a couple minutes. Okay. Now, this next thing I want to talk about, because this next part is probably going to trip some people up. This next part I want to talk about is taking up your cross. Take up your cross. Luke tells us about it. But what I want to tell you right now is what did Jesus take up when he took up the cross? He took our burden and our sins. So when simply when you take up your cross, you are taking up your sin. And you are saying, okay, I know I'm probably still going to sin because let's be honest, we sin and we don't even know that we're sinning most of the time. So let's look. Luke 9, verse 23. And he said to all, meaning Jesus, if anyone come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, a lot of you are not going to like this quote. I watched a video about this guy that didn't like it. It kind of upset me. Pastor Robert Morris said in a series he did called Divinely Human, it was literally like a year ago, he said Jesus denied his divinity when he took up his cross. Now, let me explain to you why Jesus denied his divinity. And, Pastor Will, you might not even know about this or agree with this. But Jesus denied his divinity simply by being crucified. The things that they, did you know, and I don't know if you know this, Pastor, well, Pastor Robert taught me this. Nobody has ever been scolded and crucified all at once before, ever. Now, if you find this and you, you do research and you find it, let me know. Email us. I want to know so I can correct myself. But no one has ever been scolded and crucified all at the same time. Jesus was. And it talks about it in Luke. I believe it talks about it in all the Gospels. And that just shows you how much Jesus had to go through. Jesus denied himself of all divinity and humanity. And he went to that cross. Simply what take up your cross means is denying yourself of your humanity 
I'm not saying that you're going to turn into God, but it means to humble yourself before your creator. Uh, now, a knockoff Jesus. A knockoff Jesus is simply... Oh, well, hang on. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever gone to the store and you accidentally bought a knockoff item, an off-brand item that you didn't mean to buy? Do you like knockoff versions of things? Do we like knockoff versions of things? Yeah, probably not. Why? Because you don't get the full value out of it. If you serve a knockoff of Jesus, you don't get the full value of who he is. Galatians 1, 8 through 9. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserted, deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. I'm going to make this clear. There's only one gospel. And if you preach another gospel, you're not preaching a gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. And even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. Let me say that again. Eternally condemned. And we have already said, so now, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. If you preach another Jesus, you're going to be eternally condemned. It's the truth. You just read it and heard me preach it. Hang on. Now, the Galatians had left, yeah, had left following the Jesus that Paul taught them and was instead following a, another gospel. And this was a dissertation of the one that Paul taught them, an off version. Now, I want to show you a picture of Galatia. If that'll work. So there's a picture of Galatia to give you more of an idea of the surrounding areas. And so, next thing I want to talk about is Acts 16.6. And it says, And they went through the region of Philariah and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word to Asia. No, in Asia, my bad. In Asia. When Paul addressed his letter to the Galatians, he wrote to the church churches in Galatia, rather than one single church, like he usually did. Is that correct? No, they're going to look right to truth to swear each other. Okay, okay, so semi-correct. <laughs> yeah. So, that's to a single church, and but scholars believe that the Galatians were most likely the first book of the New Testament to be written around A.D. 49. Um, I don't know how correct that is, it's just something I read online. I failed this. Oh, that's probably, yeah. Um, okay, so if it's wrong, then, uh, oh well, I admit that I don't know. <laughs> Paul had founded this church and was concerned because the new Galatian believers were being influenced by the Judaizers, Judaizers, I, yeah. Judaizers, that's quite a name, mm -hmm. G Jews who taught that salvation required keeping the Mosaic Law, the Old Testament, as well as believing in Jesus. Now, this is something that I struggled with. I always thought you can lose your salvation because a church I used to go to taught it. Some day Adventists teach that you can lose your salvation, but then they also say that the work on the cross was a completed work. They don't even know what they believe at this point. <laughs> Sorry to say that, but y'all don't even know what you believe at this point because those two contradict themselves. Jesus' finished work at the cross was a gift to God. His finished work was the end of it. So, James, how can you lose your salvation if hell's not eternal? Yeah, how can you lose your salvation if hell's not eternal, SDA? Sorry, um, mostly if you're watching this, you probably know where I live. Send me a hate mail for all I care. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but we're going to get more into that later. Can you see what he's getting into? But he's not out here. Oh, he's back there. Oh, he's in the Okay. Galatians. Galatians 1. Get wild with you, minute. Discovered the uh, paper bag. <laughs> well, if he keeps him busy, just make sure he doesn't wrap it around his neck. Because he will. Galatians 1 through 2. Paul and Apostle, not from me, nor through man, 
but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Now, here's Galatians, Galatians 2.14. Got to take another drink. By the way, if you're wondering, I did get a new jacket. Thanks for wondering. Um, I'm obsessed with this thing. You can ask Will. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is your mic on? No. Uh, okay, well, he said yeah. <laughs> Galatians 2.14. But when I saw there that their conduct, conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, sure. before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and act like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Yeah. Now, this next verse is very important. Romans 6, 17. I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. Now, this next picture is from Lake Point Church in Rockwall, Texas. B-Y-O-G. Hmm, what, the, what could that stand for? Bring your own God. Some of you are walking into church every day and you have your own God in your backpack. What I mean by your own God is you have confessed sins that you need to confess. Because confession is a very biblical thing, not the Catholic way, but going to a friend and be like, hey, I sinned, I, just, I need some prayer about this area in my life. And you don't even need to give details. You just say you need prayer over an area. But some of you need prayer. And most churches these days have a type of prayer ministry, like Gateway. There have been times where I have gone to Gateway, and they're like, oh, come down if you need prayer. And I was like, oh, I need prayer, but I don't want to go down there with all those people. Yuck. Because <laughs> point blank, I don't care for people that much. Now, I love people, but only when I am pastoring people. Not pastoring you. I don't want to talk to you. He didn't like that. <laughs> now, now, let me <laughs> ask you a question. <laughs> He's over here. <laughs> is Jesus enough? Cheeto, is Jesus enough? <laughs> Churches these days act like Christianity is a product of entertainment. People put a price tag on Jesus. Now, what I mean price tag on Jesus, I don't mean a worship team going out and touring and asking you to pay a couple bucks to go and see them. That is their career. They deserve money for what they do. They do. Like Elevation Worship, they're on tour right now and people are complaining, oh, why are you going to charge 20, 30 bucks to hear the word of God? Because that is how they get paid. A pastor gets paid to preach. In the future, when the church grows, me and Pastor Will and anybody on our staff will get paid to minister because that is your job. Being a minister is not as easy. I don't just sit down and write a sermon and, oh, my, my day's great. No, the total opposite. I get lucky if I even get time to write a sermon at the end of the day. Pastor Robert says that he spends 40 hours a week on sermon prep alone. Mm -hmm. I have spent about 15 hours this week, not all at once. But almost five hours for a couple days looking at this message, making sure that it is perfect. Yeah, I'm going to make mistakes. I already have a couple of times. But it's the effort that goes into a sermon, that goes into preaching, that goes into leading worship, that goes into making a service. Church is not for everyone. What I mean by that is the business side of the church is not for everyone. I don't want to deal with the business side. I hate the business side. That's why Pastor Will does with most of it. Not saying that I won't if I have to. If Pastor would decide to leave the church tomorrow, which please don't. <laughs> but if he ever decided to leave, I would continue this myself. Now, it may not be the same as it is now, but I would continue the ministry by myself because I know this is what God has called me to do. I just want to point out, I hate the business side as well. <laughs> uh, if anyone uh, wants to take on the role of treasurer, I would greatly appreciate it. I would too. <laughs> because our calling is to preach, teach, and lead, and Part of Pastor was calling is to work on the technology part of the church, which I think he's he enjoys it for the most part. And but I'm called to I'm called to teach, lead, and counsel. That is what I'm called to do. And oh boy, I would love to have meetings with everybody, with members of the church, three, four times a week. I would love that. It would keep me busy. But what I don't love is having to sit here and study a sermon that I think I know 
When in reality, when I get up to preach it, I'm going to make a couple mistakes because I'm human. Pastor Robert preaches in front of thousands of people every weekend, and he struggles and makes mistakes all the time. He's honest about it, just like I am. Now, what does it mean to serve another Jesus? Serving another Jesus simply means that you that the sacrifice he made on the cross did not is not enough for you. Now, the enemy loves to let you ravel in your head over and over again. Oh, I said, I am, I am horrible. God doesn't love me. But the reality is, God loves you. The enemy doesn't. Who are you going to listen to? And saying that Jesus is enough is simply saying that you are not going to 100% trust in him. Now, Galatians 1 4, 1 4 says, He gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. John 1.12 says, but, all, but, all, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of God, but of the will of God. Hebrews 10.19, Therefore, brothers, since... We have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the certain curtain, not, yeah, curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full Assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure blood. I'm going to say pure water, pure water. Yeah, I'm going to take this hot. It's a little hot. Is this? But the blood of Jesus is the only thing that can set you free from anything and everything. Nothing else can set you free from everything. Not that drink, not that drug. Nothing can set you free from everything but the blood of Jesus. There you go, much better. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, did it say to the male and not female? No, it did not. Baptists. Well, not all Baptists. Call them Baptists. Galatians 3.25. Hang on. Sorry. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under our guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. Hang on. There is no male or female. Male or female, male or female. Do you do you get it yet? Do you get it? Male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. If Jesus is enough, then you are only serving Him. Nobody else. Man cannot serve two spirits. Matthew six twenty four says, no one can serve two. So it's for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve Jesus and the world. You need to stop teasing God. Oh, I guess I don't have that. You need to stop teasing God. Many people treat God as a puppet. It only brings him out to entertain people at Bible study. Now, this is this is hard for me to say because this could ruin a lot of relationships for me. I'm tracking, please. You know, you've heard me talk about my testimony. Uh, oh, okay, there you go. And you've heard me talk about my testimony in the background I come from, a non-Christian background, clearly. And growing up, I was taught, it's, one, it's okay to yell at your kids, no matter what age they are. Two, it's okay to be in a drunken rage just because you have to watch the drink. And three, it's okay to say bad things about God because you don't believe in him. My family right now, if they've seen this message, they would never talk to me again. And I hope that if they do see this message, that God will work on their hearts and that they will be open to what God is doing. But 
as far as I know right now, none of them care for the fact that I started the church. None of them can't want anything to do with the church, but uh, like two of them out of the entire family. I literally had a cousin that persuaded another cousin to have nothing to do with me. Now, me and that cousin are back on kind of talking terms, I want to say. I don't want to say fully back, but we're back to a one-on-one -on -one basis. My family uses Jesus as a get-out-of-hell card. Like most of us do. Let's be honest. When we got saved, why did we get saved? Because we wanted to get into heaven and did not want to go to hell. Now, over time, the Holy Spirit's going to work on you. The Holy Spirit's going to change you like he does best. But many of us are still rejecting God's Spirit. Now, here are three ways to reject God's Spirit. One, taking the name of the Lord in vain, saying things like, Oh my God, Jesus Christ, that was crazy, things like that. And I don't like the fact that I even said that just to give an example. Uh, Two, being a two-faced Christian. Being a two-faced Christian simply mean, means... Going to church on Saturday, Sunday night, and then going and party the next weekend. Simply what that means. And then three, rejecting the spirit. Rejecting the spirit is when you hear, and this is most this is for believers, because a non-believer doesn't know what the Holy Spirit sounds like. But this is when you you hear the spirit, but then you're ignoring the spirit. That is rejecting the spirit. Now Next thing I'm about to say, a lot of you are not going to like, and I'm, but it's simple. It is simple. Homosexuality. I have one thing to say about this, and only one thing only. Us as the church, we need to stand up, and we need to say no, and we need to tell the devil, you need to take this back to hell, because homosexuality is the biggest sin the devil is using in this time. So we need to take a stand as the body of Christ and send homosexuality back to hell where it came from. Because this is not from the kingdom. At least not the kingdom of God. Now that does not mean that we need to be mean and disrespectful to them. If it wasn't for a good friend of mine, Christine, you've seen her give testimonies before. If it wasn't for her loving me through those times in my life where I thought being gay was okay, I might not be here today. I might not even be a believer. Because, yes, yeah, possible was only my whole life, but there was a point where we just didn't talk much. Not that people in our lives weren't talking. I think him and my dad were briefly talking. And then him and Christy were always getting together, but through Christy, me and him grow, grew closer. And then they showed me that they didn't hate me just because of the sin in my life. And they both said that they had their own sin that they had to deal with. So we don't need to hate with sexuality, but instead we just need to tell them God loves you but he doesn't love your decisions. Now, let's talk, and this is, we're getting near the end, and uh, by the way, I'm not going to be using all the scripture in here because I feel like there's a lot at the end. But I want to talk about another gospel, the prosperity gospel. First which I want to show you, that is Joe Olstein of Lakewood Church. By the way, our prayers go out to Lakewood, a tragic Shooting took place a couple weeks back, and I am still praying for them. So please be in prayer for them. And here's a picture of what the church looks like. Pretty good sized church. They're I don't think they're one of the biggest, but they're big. And then somebody that I don't have very kind thoughts of is Kenneth Copeland, which I'm not saying he's a bad guy, uh, but he has said some things I don't necessarily agree with. And then TD Jakes. The they are all prosperity preachers. They preach a gospel that is not the gospel that we preach. They preach a gospel that tells you, oh, you're going to be rich. You're going to have all this money if you just give money to the church. Is that true at, a, at an extent? Yeah, that's true for the most part. But the Bible doesn't teach that. So 1 Timothy 6, 5. And const constant friction among people who are de depraved, in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness means of gain. Then let's continue in First Timothy six nine. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires, 
that plunged people into ruin and destruction. And then continuing verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Uh, I'm going to skip to a little bit more. Where's that next? Hang on, I'm getting there. Okay, Matthew 6.10. Where's Matthew 6? Yeah. I believe that's it. No, that's Hebrew. Matthew, Matthew 6.10. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moss and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Let me ask you a question. Are you serving another Jesus? Or are you serving the Jesus that died on the cross for us? If that's well, can you get the closing ready? Now today in closing, before we get to that, I just simply want to say that I understand this message may be heavy. Actually, I know it's heavy. The reason why I have dreaded preaching this and the reason why I haven't preached yet is because I simply wanted to make sure the time was right. And God has made it clear that the time is now that we need to do this. And it breaks my heart that I even have to preach a series like this because the series isn't for everyone. Yeah, put that down and turn on tracking when you get a chance. And so, there's a famous preacher named Louis Giglio, who's a pastor of Passion City Church, and he's also the founder of Passion Conference. And he has an amazing book out that uh, he released in 2017 that I have been reading, and... It is called Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table. So now, me and Pastor are going to enjoy some some dinner and have a conversation in a way. <laughs> hey, man, uh, anyone sitting here? I don't care. I'm sitting here. What's up? So how are you? Oh, I'm good. You know, oh, I've been waiting forever to sit here with my child and just talk to you. Oh. Okay. And as your father... It just means the world that you're even taking this time to speak to me. So let's let's dig in. Okay. What are you eating? Uh, tuna. What about you? Mm. <laughs> Chicken bacon ranch. Mm, really good. A bit too much mayo. <laughs> I'll let the chef know. <laughs> and you know, it's times like this that I'm so thankful that I created the flood and that I had the new covenant with Noah. I think that's how it goes. Yeah, something like that. And I made a promise to Noah to never destroy my people like that again and never cause pain to you because I love my children so much. And now this is what it'll look like to talk to Satan. I'm going to be Satan. You just talk to me like regular. Okay. Uh, so, um, uh, tell me more about um, this uh, God fella. You don't need to know about him. It's not like he's going to accept you for who you are. You sin so much. Why would he want you for who you are? All the things you look at at night, all the thoughts you have about all the women in your church. Why would he want anything to do with you? Right. Why would he? You think that with Jesus, it was enough for you. But the truth is, how do you know there was a Jesus? You didn't meet him. Now, what, this is back to me, Pastor Rustin. Can you tell the difference between God and Satan? Can you tell the difference about how he felt when he was talking to his father versus how he was talking to the enemy? There's a difference. By preaching another Jesus, you are letting in Satan at your table. And the thing is, when he walked over here, or should I say when I sat down, he couldn't tell the difference. Until I started speaking. We don't tell the difference until we speak. Now, we could end it here, I think. Mm -hmm. 
And yeah, let's just end it here. Okay. Sorry, I thought I was going to eat more. <laughs> and shit. Fuck. Okay. Well, thank you guys for joining us today. We really hope this message was some type of inspiration. And join us next week as we talk about what it's like for the God to talk to us, what it's like for the spirit, and what it's like for the enemy and his demons to talk to us. Thank you.